It is good to be with you. And um, before I say anything else, I just got word a little bit ago that for those of you that have been to Swaziland, most of you have um, that have gone there have met um, the Longas. Israel was the principal of the school for many years and still is a, uh, has influence there. His wife, Vicki, passed away this morning. And um, remember that family in prayer. Um, they had a lot of sickness and uh, she, she went to be with the Lord today. So remember them. Well, today, today is a day that I guess I never really thought would come. Same, you know, life just goes on and on and you expect things to stay the same. But my last day is a pastor at Hyde Wesleyan Church, um, and uh, we'll still be here, just won't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but what a difference 38 years made. Um, Cindy and I had spent four years planning a church in western Kentucky before we received the call to come and be the pastor at Hyde Wesleyan, and Hyde Wesleyan was my dad's home church, so it's always had a place in my life and my, my heart. And um, uh, our first Sunday at Hyde, there were 17 people, and four of them were our family. And so that was the beginning. And uh, shortly after um, we settled, uh, or we, we came, um, a lady, many of you know, Gloria Gill, started attending and she shortly after that gave her heart to the Lord and the Lord saved her and um, there she had two boys and you know one of them anyway Jason Gill he was five years old and he was very rambunctious and um, he used to embarrass his mom crawling under the seats during service and but 20 years ago he grew up and I had the privilege of marrying, uh, performing the ceremony for he and Shannon. And this year, Jay Lee, their daughter, graduates from high school. So that kind of gives you a perspective of the time that we have spent here and uh, the lives that have come and gone and that we've had the privilege to, to interact with. Life does go by so very quickly. And over the years, the Lord has blessed and helped this church to grow. And I was just looking at our schedule of service and uh, counting the people that are involved in um, just serving today. And uh, there, there's like 30, 30 people or so that are serving in different capacities today. And um, that's almost twice as many as was here the first service that we had for the whole service. So we thank the Lord for what he's doing. And I thank him for allowing me the privilege of spending almost my entire adult life um, serving as a shepherd here at Hyde Wesleyan. And I thank you for the privilege of allowing me to be your pastor these many years. This morning as we come to the end of a year and looking at another year, I'd like for us to uh, look at a passage of scripture in, in Numbers chapter 13. And it's a very familiar story of the children of Israel had uh, been delivered from, from Egypt, were on their way to what God had promised, and now they got to the Jordan River and Moses sent 12 spies to spy out the land, to see what the situation was that they were going to be facing. And these spies came back with a report. And it says after, beginning at verse 25, after exploring the land for 40 years, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there 
are a powerful, are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan River. But Caleb, one of the spies, tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go up at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them were like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Then the whole community began weeping aloud. They cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt, or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it have been better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephthah, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. Today, we stand together here on the bank of 2023, looking across the way into the new land of 2024. And as we look and listen, we may hear reports of what could go wrong over there or what we might expect in that land. And listening to the news and looking at our country and looking at the world, it's enough to depress us for sure. As we listen, we begin to envision what we could be up against. And maybe a pang of fear strikes as we think of the giants that we may have to face uh, larger than life that we will encounter in the year ahead of us. Not only are there global and national turmoil, but many of us are facing uncertainties in our, in our own lives and in our family lives. Some of us, we know, are facing health issues. Some may be facing financial, family, and relationship uncertainties. When we know if we cross the river into 2024, there will be battles. And they may be completely different than anything that we have ever faced up until now. And as we look across this river to what lies on the other side of January 1st, we can only speculate as to what our lot may be. There will be decisions. There will be choices. There will be stands that we will have to take and battles we will have to fight. And some of which may not be popular. They may not be easy, and the outcome may be very uncertain. There will be mountains, there will be giants, there will be rivers to cross. But God has also promised a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of blessing, a land where his presence abides. The question is, will we believe God for the blessing that he wants to give us, and will we follow in obedience? Or will we allow those mountains, those giants, those walled cities to blind us to the blessing of what God wants to give us? And as the reports of this new land begin to come rolling in, 
how are we going to handle it? What should we do? What shouldn't we do? How should we approach it? Sometimes the best way to learn something is to learn what not to do. I've shared this story with you before, but it fits here. When Cindy and I were talking about getting married and one of her hang-ups was that she was going to be marrying a preacher. And she didn't know what that was like. She didn't grow up in a pastor's home. And she, it scared her. What, what would be her role as a pastor's wife? We were serving in a church as an assistant pastor of a small church in, outside of Cincinnati. And, and um, the pastor's wife was a, a nice enough lady, but she was unique. And um, she would sit on the front pew right there, and when the pastor would get up to preach, she would sit there and she would correct him. If he told an illustration, no, it didn't go that way. This is the way it went. And she would, you know, maybe a verse of scripture or whatever, she would, she would correct him from down below. And there were many other things that were unique about her. And so I told Cindy, I said, Cindy, just look at her. And whatever she does, don't do it. And it worked. <laughs> this morning we are looking at this story not as an example of what to do and what to be, but of things that we don't want to do this year if we are going to experience the blessing of God in our life. We want to look at some things that these children of Israel did. The first thing they did was they had forgotten the past. They had forgotten what God had done. As the 12 spies began to share all that they had seen and experienced in their foray into the Canaan land as they went to spy out the land, the children of Israel were confronted with a new set of choices. Do we cross this river? Do we climb those mountains? Do we engage those giants? Do we go up against walled cities? And they struggled and they wrestled with that there as they heard this report. Uh, but looming larger in their field of vision uh, than all of those obstacle, obstacles was a fog of doubt that had rolled over their souls. And that doubt clouded them from seeing uh, God, from seeing the God who had brought them to this point already. Were the giants of Anak more powerful or greater than the Pharaoh of Egypt? Was the God who broke the back of the Egyptians not able to crush these heathen tribes? Were the walls of Canaan greater and more intimidating to Jehovah than the great Red Sea where with a breath of his wind he opened up a passage and made a way through? How could they have forgotten all that God had done to get them to the bank of the Jordan River. These were not things that they had read about. This was not something their mom and dad and grandma had told them about things that had happened in the past. These were things they had experienced. These people had experienced all of those great and miraculous acts of God in their life. Uh, how quick we are to forget the great works of God in our life, individually and in the life of the church. It's easy for fear to fill our hearts because all these things are true. There are powerful giants in the land. There are mountains that are going to have to be climbed and ri rivers to be forged and walls uh, to be brought down. But Joshua and Caleb declared... The Lord will lead us into that land. The Lord will give it to us. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid. Let's go and do what God has told us to do. Wow, what a difference. Joshua and Caleb declared, yes, all these things are true, but God. And when we look at life and we see the giant, if we can yell, we can acknowledge it, but God, but God. But the Israelites chose to listen to the ten. They had forgotten the past. 
There was this new problem that lay before them and it seemed too big. It loomed so large that it filled their vision to the point that they were not able to see God. How could they have forgotten the mighty deliverance from Egypt? How could they have forgotten so quickly the manna and the quail that God had fed them with? The water that he had brought out of a rock to quench their thirst. How could they not recall the awesome power of God on Sinai as he gave them the Ten Commandments? And yet they did. How fast faith flees when all we look at is the circumstances we find ourselves in and fail to hear God saying, go and possess the land for I am with you. Be obedient to what I've called you to do and to be. But not only had they forgotten the past, they were allowing themselves to become satisfied with the present. When the reports came rolling in, all they heard was the bad news. Isn't that just like us? It seems that we, in our human nature, gravitate to the negative. If somebody says something negative, that's seems where we go first. And they allowed their imaginations to run wild. Supposition controlled their reaction to the point that they concluded that Egypt, slavery, maybe really wasn't as bad as they had thought it was. And maybe we just ought to go back to Egypt. How easy it is to allow the roadblocks that Satan (coughs) excuse me, throws in our way to keep us from possessing all that God would like to do through us and for us. And we content ourselves to enjoy as best we can the wilderness when just across the river lays a land of milk and honey, a land of victory, not a land without battles, not a land where everything is easy, but a land where victory is ours because we walk in obedience with the God that has called us to face whatever it is in our life. May we never become satisfied with where we are. May we never say this is as best as it can get and we're just going to, we're just going to do this and not go forward. As individuals and as a church, We need to be more determined than ever to conquer the territory that God is calling us into. That our lives may make a difference where God has planted us. May it be said that Clearfield is a better place because the Hyde Wesleyan Church is here. May it be said that your family is better, that your workplace is better, that your friends are better people because you are there. Don't be satisfied with the present. The Israelites, they had forgotten the past, became satisfied, content with their present lot, and it caused them to become overcome with fear. Fear of the future, of what could be and what is out there that they had no control over. And I must confess that that's what I struggle with the most. When the doctor says the disease you have has no cure and the damage has can't be reversed. Retirement sounds exciting, but it can also be scary. The word cancer can shake you to the core. But those things get me to the point of asking, is the God that I have preached about for 45 years, is he enough? Is God enough? And and when we begin to look at the things we face and the things that are uncertain, is God enough to get me through this? Scripture says the children of Israel, Israel wept the whole night long. Statistically, Realistically, rationally, their fear was justified. To them, their journey from Egypt was ending in failure. If they crossed that river, they were going to be defeated, they were going to be plundered, 
they were going to die. At least that's the way they saw it. The fear was justified because the picture they were painting was one that for them to succeed, it was all dependent on what they thought they were able to do. But one thing was missing. God. Without God, there was only defeat. There was only a, a life full of failure. There was only death. But Caleb and Joshua had a totally different vision of what the future held. They had not forgotten God. They had not forgotten the God who had delivered them from the hands of Pharaoh. They had not forgotten the God that conquered the Red Sea for them. They had not forgotten the God who had provided manna and quail and water when there was nothing to eat or drink. And they knew that that same God would give them victory in the battles that lay ahead because that same God was the one who led them to this point. Caleb and Joshua definitely were not satisfied with their present condition of wandering in the wilderness. They had seen with their own eyes. They had tasted what God wanted to give them. And now nothing less would satisfy their soul than all that God had promised. So why should they fear the future? Was not the God who brought them all this way from slavery to the shores of the promised land? Was he not the same God that was now commanding them to cross the Jordan River to take possession of that land that he had promised and wants to give to them? Caleb and Joshua shook off their fears. <clears throat> sure, they were human. They saw the giants. They had even scaled some of those very walls of the city that they were now called to go and possess. But they chose to embrace courage. For God was the one who had called them to this journey. Both groups, the ten and the two, both basically had the exact same report. Both agreed that the land was flowing with milk and honey, that the cities were walled, that the people were armed, that there were giants in the land. But the ten only saw the obstacles. They only saw the roadblocks. And they fed on each other's fear and negativity and were consumed uh, with a cloud of doubt. But Caleb and Joshua knew that if God says go then all they needed uh, was faith and the courage to be obedient. That, all the rest was up to God. All the rest of victory was up to him. I read a quote yesterday that someone posted. It says, the Bible never once says, figure it out. But over and over and over and over again, it says, trust God. It doesn't say, you've got to figure it out. I hope you can make it. I'll be there waiting for you. It just says, trust God. And you're going to be facing some things uh, that you just can't figure out. And you're going to have to trust them. There have been many times on my journey that the only way I got through it was to say, God, this is not my problem. You put me here and I'm trusting you to see me through. You have to figure it out. And many times God calls us, as he did the children of Israel, to things that are bigger than us. And when he does, do I look at those giants and say, okay, I've got to figure this out. Or do we say with Caleb and Joshua, God will not only bring me to, but he will bring me through. Just don't disobey God. So here we stand at the close, as close to the new, new year as we can get from this side. Do we allow the roadblocks and the twists and turns that will surely come, do we allow them to stop us, to rob us of the victory that comes through obedience to God? Do we embrace the negativity that surrounds us, whether it comes from the news or from 
family or friends or even our own heart? Or do we cry the cry of Caleb? Let us go up at once and take this land. We can do this. Let us do what God has called us to do and be what God has called us to be. If we go forward with courage and faith and obedience, allowing God to fight for us as a church and as individuals, we too will see even more great and mighty works of God as he delivers us from and delivers us through all the fears we may have of what 2024 and the future may hold. And he helps us to conquer the giants, each and every one that stand in our way. If we do not forget what God has done, if we never become satisfied with our present lot, and if we don't give in to the fear of the future that causes us to freeze in disobedience, victory is ours for the claiming. For God is the great I am, the same yesterday, today, and will forever be. Let us go in. Possess 2024 for Christ. Let us be the men and women. Let us be the church that God has called us to be, that we will make a difference in the world, the situations he has placed us in, that our lives will reflect his glory, as Brenda said, that we will be that moon that reflects his glory clearly to all who look and see. Will you bow your heads with me? Father God, Thank you for calling us. Thank you that you have a plan for 2024. Thank you that you know the beginning from the end, not only of all things of history, but of our lives. And Lord, I pray that you will help us when we face the giants, when we face those walls that it just seems we can't get through, that we will say it's not ours, it's God's. And realize that we don't have to figure it out, but we can trust God. You have it. We pray your blessing upon each and every one here. We pray your blessing upon this church. We pray your blessing upon Pastor Stevan as he leads. And we pray that we will be what you want us to be. To the glory of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You and Cindy come here. I want you to come. We stand. We stand with me. I want to take an opportunity to ask Bob and Cindy to come forward and to lay hands on them. I'm going to invite our board members, some of our leaders, teachers. Would you come forward with me? And Dad, I'm going to ask you to pray over Bob and Cindy for me. Our friends. Would you come on, board members? Come on. You can keep signing, Jill. Thank you. Would you, church, Hyde Wesleyan Church, would you extend a hand this direction? Will you join us in this attitude of prayer over Pastor Bob and Cindy in this unique opportunity? Thanks, Suzanne. What a unique moment. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony of leadership well. Thank you for guiding Bob and Cindy here. Guiding them during. Now, as a congregation, our lifetime, have a brand new focus for us. Bless them, guide them. They've had 38 years of ministry in the promised land. May what they're facing now be better than the promised land. <laughs> Lord, 
relationships they have built down through these years, may they simply be some stronger, solidified. Thank you for the ease of arranging coming on these daily schedules. Open up, Lord, more opportunities. As this congregation and pastoral staff continue to love on, blessings be upon you all. Given us all this opportunity to excel, help in these next months as the celebration day actually comes in March. Guide in these next. Thank you. Thank you that we can remember. Thank you that we can be challenged. God bless you, church.